Hello, everyone. My name is Emily Morris. I'm the Director of Alumni Services and Outreach with the Columbia Alumni Association. And thank you for coming tonight. We have an amazing program with some very distinguished panelists. I want to say a very, very brief word. Your alma mater, Columbia. Um, the CAA, the Columbia Alumni Association, exists to connect Columbians with each other and back with the university. And an evening like tonight is a, a perfect example of that. We hope that you make many networking connections. And we also hope that you'll tell us your ideas of how we can further connect you, whether it's an online program or further events like this. We love hearing your feedback. I want to briefly ask some of our career coaches who are in the audience to, uh, to stand up for just a moment. Great, Charles, Eric, Bob. <laughs> um, we have a career coaches network. It's one of the many um, aspects of Columbia's career services. So you saw these coaches here tonight. Feel free to talk with them. They are wise and have lots of career advice to impart upon you. And the speakers tonight, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. They can speak for themselves much better than I ever could. But we designed this evening to truly kind of have a very robust dynamic discussion about what today's professional looks like when there's no longer a common one-track career. So tonight, we hope you'll come away with practical takeaways, some inspiration, some ideas about personal stories. Um, and once again, welcome. Please let us know if you have any questions or issues after the uh, speakers um, speak individually for a few moments. We'll have some Q&A, so keep an eye out for the roving microphone and raise your hand if you don't see it. And then we will um, be in a, the next room for the networking reception. So thanks, welcome. Eric, over to you. Thank you, thank you, this is working. Hi, I'm Eric Horowitz, I'm a career coach and I'm from the class of 1990. So all you 90s out there, ha ha hello. Um, I was going to talk to you today about understanding that the net only appears when you jump which essentially means that your career and your career transition will only start when you're willing to take a chance. So I'm going to give you a couple of personal stories, hopefully that'll elucidate the point, and then um, some good tips for you. So the first one actually is in 1986, when I came to Columbia from Denver, Colorado, I decided that I wanted a job in business. So I went down to Wall Street and I went, met with a recruiter and I said, I want a job in business. So he goes, I got the job for you. He writes down an address, One World Trade Center. And I'm this hick from Colorado, and I'm thinking, I'm going down to One World Trade Center. So I go down there, my first day, I have my card, they take me to the trading floor. I'm like, I got a job in business, this is awesome. So they take me to the oil options pit where they traded oil. Now this is before the internet, okay? So they had these little cards, and essentially my job was to sit in the middle of the oil options pit they would stick a net over my head. And then they would take these little cards after they traded oil at $38, and they would throw the cards at my head all day. My job was not to catch the cards. It was to allow the cards to hit my head and fall on the net, and then stamp the cards. I went to Columbia University, and I am stamping cards. I did this for three whole weeks. Finally, I got the nerve to go up to my boss and say, you know, I went to Columbia University and I think I'm way overqualified for this position. <laughs> he proceeded to convince me that I was not overqualified for the position, <laughs> which I believed and worked there for two more weeks before I finally got the courage to quit. Okay, so that was essentially my first career transition. So I went to Columbia for four years and uh, after my four years at Columbia, I uh, had a Columbia baby, my daughter, who's now 23. So again, I had to transition again, because I had a child, and I worked in human resource consulting for 12 years. Did I want to be a human resource consultant? Absolutely not. I had to pay the bills. But I was really, really good at it. And I got all the way to the top floor at PricewaterhouseCoopers. I was a director. I was really important. One day, we're talking about I don't know, Six Sigma and something else I didn't care about. Like what day, what Tuesday were we gonna do a production move? And, and one of my uh, peers walks into the office, he says, you know, one of the towers just fell down. Like one of the towers just fell down, what does that mean? So our office was in Fort Lee, New Jersey, so we all walked out uh, and we looked and 
there was one tower standing and one tower was down. And then as we were watching, another tower fell. And that transition for me was, I realized how tenuous everything is, how tenuous a career is, how tenuous life can be. And in that moment, I was 32 years old, and I thought to myself, um, if I keep being a human resource consultant, that's what they're gonna write on my tombstone. Eric Horowitz, human resource consultant. So within six months, I had quit my job, and I had um, hired a coach myself, and I thought, what could I do? What could I be? And I had never, ever thought about any of that. So um, that moment, that aha moment, watching that one tower stand and one tower fall, made me realize like everything can change. So I became a coach myself, but I also did consulting. I consulted with many of the clients I had worked with uh, in my consulting days, Bank of America, Reuters, Lehman Brothers, AIG. I'm doing great. I'm a coach half my time and half the time I'm consulting and the world is awesome. And then there's this day in 2008 and I have three awesome consulting clients, Bank of America, Lehman Brothers, and AIG. <laughs> and I call up the woman from Lehman Brothers and I'm like, hello, I'm coming in today. And she says, no, you're not. I said, am I gonna get my check? Needless to say, within one week, all of half my business went away. And my daughter is over here and she was with me. That's my wonderful daughter, who's now 23. And she's like, dad, are we gonna have dinner tonight? I'm like, I'm really not sure. But what I did was I went to yoga, and <laughs> which is what you should do when everything's going wrong. And I said, I said, this has got to be a sign, because why would my three biggest clients all like essentially give all their money away to the wrong people? Um, and I got to let this go. So on that day in 2008, I said, you know, I, I don't have as much business as I need. But clearly the universe is telling me it's time to really do what you really wanted to do, which was to be a coach. So essentially what I said was, I'm just gonna let them go and I'm gonna just work on the business and if I struggle sometimes, I struggle sometimes, but I'm gonna listen to the universe when it says it's time to transition. And just as you know, during that time, I was coaching many people in banking and financing, people in journalism, and I was often saying, like sometimes you gotta look at how the winds have changed, not because you did anything wrong, but because the world is changing and being willing to respond, to let go of that. And one of my dreams actually, when I became a coach was I thought someday I'll go back to Columbia and maybe I could be a coach at, at Columbia. And during 2008 and 2009, I got a, a message from uh, you know, LinkedIn that Columbia was looking for career co coaches to create a career coaching network. And here I am today and so essentially, from the time this dream started, which was in 1986 when I told the guy I wanted a job in business, till today, which is, I don't know, many years later and a lot less hair, um, I got there. So when I'm talking to all, all you tonight about transitioning or thinking about transitioning or it's your first transition or whatever it is, is from the moment you even have the aha moment that you would like to do something different to the moment that you're fully 100% doing something different could take 10 years. Okay? Or it could take five years, it could take two minutes, but there's gonna be some long-term strategy and time to go from step one to the end step. Okay? And like even today, I feel like, okay, I did it. All right, so now I'm gonna give you with my cards, these are not the original cards used to throw at my head, um, some, some tips. What I'd like you to do is not actually write the tips down. These are good transition tips, but really listen for something that moves you or, or you feel it and that's the thing you wanna try to take in, okay? So number one transition tip is access supreme humility. So whatever position you got to in your job over all those years, just understand that now you gotta start over, okay? That's one. Two, six month income rule. Make sure you have six months of income in the bank, in cash, before you start out on a new thing because you need time to, to move into a transition period. Okay, um, go back to school or the school of hard knocks. So whatever you've learned to date, when you start out something new, you gotta learn all new things. So it doesn't matter, you know, all the stuff you learned before, be willing to learn new things. All right, that one's not so good. All right, <laughs> the next one is make a three-year plan and don't expect it to work. 
So if you say in three years, I'm, you know, now I'm a lawyer and now I wanna, you know, I wanna be a singer, give yourself three years to do it, that's your expectation, and at the end you might find that you're making pottery and you love that. Okay. Get positive help and not from your parents. So however you got here, your parents had a very big role in whatever it is you became. So the idea is get help, get help from peers, from a coach, whatever, but not sometimes from your parents. Okay, uh, patience and fortitude. So be very patient um, and have fortitude because you're gonna have down days, like when all three of your biggest clients fire you. Um, understand where you are in the immigrant story. So for example, my grandfather was a tailor. My father was a doctor, I'm a businessman, and my daughter wants to save the world, okay? So the idea is, and if you look at where you are in the immigrant story, oftentimes the children of immigrants become doctors and lawyers to get that, that position, and then their children don't wanna be doctors and lawyers, so they become you know, business people, and then their children find their way. So if you understand kind of where you are in your family story, that helps you figure out what it is you wanna do and where you're at. And then, Probably my last one, which is write down your aha moment. So my aha moment was when the towers fell and I thought, oh my God, if I just keep doing this, this is my, gonna be my life. And write it down, create a journal, really think about it, describe the story to yourself of what that aha moment is because after the aha moment, your brain is gonna tell you all the reasons why that aha moment wasn't true, okay? So those are my nine tips because I didn't like my last tip. Um, hopefully this gave you some inspiration about the journey that we're all on and the chances that we're going to all take. And basically, the net will only appear when you jump. So jump and, you know, get ready. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm going to now tell you the story of my career. Um, and this is a story of someone who's done nothing of what Eric just spoke about. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I have about 30 years to get through in 10 minutes, so I'm gonna just get on it. Uh, graduated Columbia in 1981, I was an engineer. And uh, we know as Colombians, we graduate on a Wednesday afternoon. On the following Monday morning, I was at work. I had gotten a job on Wall Street with Morgan Stanley, and I spent the next 20 Monday mornings uh, well, next 20 years worth of Monday mornings at Morgan Stanley in a variety of roles. I'm gonna have to do a lot of long story short here, but long story short, um, I ultimately worked my way to the trading floor and I spent the bulk of my career at Morgan Stanley uh, developing and managing quantitatively sophisticated products, primarily in fixed income financing markets. And, you know, getting into the late 90s, uh, my product was a product that was kind of being disintermediated on Wall Street and come the bursting of the dot-com bubble um, in 2001, uh, Morgan Stanley told me that they no longer needed me. And let me tell you, I was devastated. During Man Morgan Stanley's glory years, I drank the Morgan Stanley Kool-Aid like nobody. I never wanted to work for any other firm my entire career. I would have to. So anyway, I was a pretty young guy then. I was in my early 40s, and I got right on it. Uh, focus job search. Within a few months, I was working at CIBC um, in a role where I was starting an equity finance business for them, which basically meant I was developing and managing specialized finance products. Same product they did at Morgan Stanley. Different market, different company, same expertise. A very, very traditional transition. Again, long story short, seven years at, Morgan, at uh, CIBC, and Right before Christmas in 2008, another long story short, um, I was asked to leave the keys under the door on my way out after spending most of the year shutting most of the things that I had built in the previous seven years. And this time though, I wasn't devastated, I wasn't angry, I was expecting it, and it almost came as a relief. And so finally now, after 27 years on Wall Street, I had the first following Monday morning where I really had absolutely no place to go. And frankly, I wasn't real, I wasn't in a hurry to do anything about it. Um, despite the cratered markets, I had some assets in the bank. My wife and I were not over levered on the house, so we were very lucky. Two, I had never really had any time off. And three, frankly, the environment on Wall Street for looking for a job was abysmal, so why waste your time? 
So my plan was not to have a plan, even if I took the whole year off. Well, anyway, that year went pretty darn quick. <laughs> Besides a lot of biking, backpacking, summer at the beach, turning 50, I thought a lot about what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I came to some key decisions. And the first decision was that I did not want to go back to the sell side of Wall Street. What I decided I would do would to, would to, was to make a, what was still a pretty common transition for someone with my experience and move to the buy side of the business and find a role uh, on the asset management side. So I kind of got my resume together and did a lot of work. I was able to manage uh, to get some office space in the city through a buddy of mine. I bought my first train pass in a year, and I started some really pretty serious networking. Well, I'll have to do another long story short. After two years of literally every day, we're talking hundreds of meetings, thousands of phone calls, thousands of emails, nothing. I was no closer to an opportunity than when I started. And unfortunately, I had no plan B but I knew I needed a plan B. Otherwise, my kids would be applying for financial aid. So, as a lot of people in this room have probably experienced when you're searching for a job, false leads, dead ends. The whole process seems incredibly unproductive, at least until you land something. And then when you do, all is good. But after two years of this, you have no idea how unimaginably unproductive I felt like I had literally wasted two years of my life. So, in the, in, sort of in the interim, my house was experiencing some pretty serious deferred maintenance issues. Parts of it were falling down in front of my eyes. And so I took the view, I'm gonna feel productive. I'm gonna do this myself. <laughs> so, so I engaged in about a nine-month period of ceiling to floor do-it-yourself projects. And I actually felt really productive. And they actually came out pretty good. Keep in mind, that's me saying so. Uh, but, uh, but kind of while I was doing this work and getting dirty every day, I did think a lot about Plan B. Unfortunately, I never ever came up with a plan B that excited me enough to want to stop doing the restoration projects. So about halfway through this, through this time period, it's now the middle of the summer, I get a call from a buddy of mine, a guy that I knew from uh, biking, sort of a road biking buddy of mine. And he says, Bill, I just quit my job on Wall Street. He was in the wealth management business. And I'm starting my own company. Let's get together. I want to tell you about it. So I was curious, and a few afternoons later, I, um, I drove over to his office to meet him. So uh, you got to picture this, this guy's office. It's mildew-laden. There's no windows. It's in the basement of the Capitol Theater in Port Chester, New York. <laughs> and so Peter starts saying, Bill, I am starting a business. I am starting a specialty finance operating company it's going to be a billion dollars within five years. And I am going to underwrite, originate, service, and manage loans to people with troubled credit histories so they could buy really old used cars. Bill, what do you think? So my visceral response was, all right, let me get this straight, Peter. You're telling me you just quit your job on the street, kind of like a job I've been trying to get for two years with no success, so that you can sit in the submarine down here and rip off poor people. <laughs> well, anyway, we had a longer conversation. <laughs> and uh, what I did learn is that Peter had actually been on this for a while. He'd actually already brought on an experienced operator down in the Tampa, Florida area who was going to build a back office for this company down in Tampa. And this guy was actually throwing some money at the venture as well. I also real, he also told me that he had, he had identified an experienced auto finance guy in the New York area who would manage auto dealerships for him. So there was a, 
you know, there was a, a little more than just this idea. So Peter finally asked me, said, Bill, you know, I know you're out there talking to a lot of people. Why don't you think about your networks? Is there anybody in your network that would be interested maybe in investing in a venture like this? So I said, Peter, okay, I'll think about it. I'll come back to you. So I went back home and worked on my projects. And uh, at this point, I was getting a lot of spousal pressure to maybe do my projects a little faster than I was doing them. Um, and in between waiting for paint and spackle and cement to dry, I, was, I did a lot of reading on subprime auto finance. And what I discovered was that the reality was if you're someone with a damaged credit history, an auto loan is probably the best, fastest way to fix your credit score. And there was actually a bunch of companies out there that actually had very good reputations in the market for enabling this. The other thing I learned is that since the financial crisis, subprime auto loans, about the absolute best performing asset class in the capital markets. So I was kind of intrigued. So at the end of the summer after Labor Day, I gave Peter a call back. I said, hey, Peter, you know, I was kind of thinking about it a little bit. I'm potentially interested maybe in working my network a little bit. Let me find you some investors. Um, you know, I knew I had to start networking again anyway. Give me something to talk about at least. <laughs> Nobody wanted to talk about giving me a job. So well, we got together and I had an opportunity to actually look at his business plan in detail. <laughs> And what I discovered was, great business plan. The financial model, about as unsophisticated and naive as you can imagine. And boom, light bulb. Hey, Bill, these guys are not mathematicians. You can help them. And a conversation ensued. And by the end of September, we were discussing a personal investment of mine and full-time role for me with the company. I knew that I could make their financial model better than their business plan. So. Anyway, now I had a decision to make. On the plus side, ground floor opportunity, fragmented market, huge potential upside, and there was actually an already identified areas for where my skill set would apply. Now, what could go wrong? So I had to think about the downside. One, 27 years on Wall Street. My credit experience was a zippo nada period nothing, let alone subprime auto. All I knew about cars was how to turn one on and drive it. Two, thinking about sort of the investment. I knew that if I invested not enough money, the venture may not even get off the ground. It may not be enough to get to the next level. And I also knew if I didn't invest enough money, I might not have enough influence, and I might not be able to maximize my participation in the venture. On the other side, if I invested too much, personal risk part becomes really scary. And by scary, what I mean is, the thing fails, sell your house. Move to a low cost part of Florida and live off your bingo winnings. And wish your kids luck on finding a scholarship. <laughs> three, I mean, this was a startup. I hadn't seen a paycheck now in three years. I get involved in this thing, there's no paycheck for the foreseeable future. Just so you know, I'm working for healthcare now. <laughs> And then finally, this whole thing, this whole idea, it's a great idea, but little more than that right now. What the heck do you pay for it? What's it worth? So anyway, my, my wife Mary and I, we, we discussed it. And her view was that if it led to the cleaning up of the mess, which is what she referred to my projects as now, that she was all for it. <laughs> uh, and not to make light of the downside, because the reality is the downside I just described I lose sleep over every night. It's real and it's enormous. Okay? So anyway, I became an entrepreneur. And the only thing I want to say, well, the only thing I have time to say about being an entrepreneur is how incredibly I underestimated, I mean, grossly underestimated the roller coaster nature of starting a business. The high of the highs, the low of the lows. The other thing I'll say is I totally I, I totally did not underestimate the amount of work required. But the other good thing is I did not overestimate the transferability of my skills. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll kind of leave the entrepreneur stories at that. Entrepreneur stories are better over cocktails anyway. Let me finish up by just talking about, well, let me finish by answering the following question. How's it all working out? So I've been at it now for a little over a year. And in that year, we've made tremendous progress. The team is now nine people. One of those, one of those 
people is a former head of a major auto finance company. One member of the team is the former head of a publicly traded manufactured housing REIT. And one of those guys is the former CEO of what was at the time the largest independent auto leasing company in the country. We've built a technology platform, well, kind of stitched one together, put, built part of it, and we're using commercially available stuff on the rest. Um, that's front to back. We can originate service and manage our loans. We enhance that platform every day. And most importantly, we're actually making loans. We have, we've, we've made loans in the states of Florida and the state of New York, and we're licensed to make loans in several more states at this point in time. Now, all that being said, the end of the story hasn't been written yet. In fact, the end of the beginning of the story hasn't been written yet. But what we do have is we have a real fighting shot. Thank you. Okay. Um, my name is Rob Cox. I am a graduate of Columbia University's Journalism School. Uh, so uh, I'm going to tell you a story about journalism and the media business and how great a decision that was to join the uh, newspaper business in 1990s. Um, but I'm also going to tell you, uh, hopefully, a story about um, that might inspire you uh, in one, on one way. What I've learned, and I'm going to tell you about my personal uh, story as well, um, it's really, it doesn't really matter what industry you've gone to. It really matters kind of what skills you have and how you can creatively apply those skills to what, to things that you, you just talked about, Bill, to disruption. Disruption is, it's, this is supposed to be a TED Talk, right? So let's use the word disruption because that's one of those buzzwords you hear a lot about on TED Talks and in Silicon Valley. And my God, uh, let me tell you about disruption in the media industry. So in 1991, I went to Columbia Journalism School and back then, um, you, there was no internet. I mean, the, the only place it existed, I think, was like Al Gore's office in Capitol Hill. Um, and you were given a choice then uh, to specialize in, um, and this is sort of quaint, I almost feel nostalgic for it, um, newspapers, broadcast, or magazines. That was, uh, they were very distinct silos, right? Um, and there was this one guy, uh, I can't remember his name, like maybe Professor Ross, is that a guy's name? I mean, if someone from J School might know, um, who did something called computer-assisted reporting. Isn't that nice? Computer you came in with a floppy disk. Um, anyway, I chose newspapers. Really great idea. Um, because that's where the greatest potential job opportunities clearly lay. Um, based on past performance, I wasn't totally um, stupid in thinking that. Uh, in 1992, which is the year I graduated, uh, advertising rev revenues in newspapers were $31 billion, according to the Newspaper Association of America, and they had nearly doubled from what, where they had been in 1982. So past performance, indicative of future performance. Um, anyway, they kept growing. They hit $49 billion in 2000. Uh, any, anyone can hazard a guess as to what happened after that? So last year... Uh, newspaper advertising revenues were $22 billion, so they more than halved. Um, that is a very big uh, form of disruption. Um, and by the way, that, that figure includes digital advertising, which is like 3 or $4 billion. Now, that's going to grow, sure. But, um, so if you think outsourcing automation and globalization suck, you have not actually been in the newspaper business or seen something, um, I guess what you would call being gutted by technological disruption. Um, Anyway, the, the, thing, the good news is I didn't get, didn't get completely killed by that. So in 2000, I actually went out and started an internet business. Woohoo! And uh, that business um, was uh, very focused. It was, uh, it was trying to basically work people like you, Bill, and people in the financial industry. We started it in London. It was a subscription business, which is really old school. Um, you know, we didn't um, have Twitter and all that kind of stuff back then. Um, but all of us were able to take these skills that we had and transfer them, bring them to bear in this new organization that we created. Um, and that, I guess that was sort of the, the lesson. Um, over the next eight years, we built this thing. It was called Breaking Views. Uh, it was um, it was fine. You know, we, we, we sold it um, to Thomson Reuters for about $30 million, which is sort of like funny ha-ha money in relative to all the money that's made in, in Silicon Valley. But, and we had a lot of mouths to feed, let me tell you. But, um, you know, lots of funding rounds. 
Um, but but it but it was a relative success. And and, and the, when I look back on it, I mean, so much of what the reason it worked was because we had really good people. We were able to create a whole that was worth more than the sum of the parts by basically finding you know using these people who were. Um, all very bright, even though very different people, um, and putting them to, into a group. Now, I look at that we sold the business, what, three years ago, four years ago. I look at, at the business now, and it is the, the media business or journalism, whatever you want to call it, and it's gone into sort of complete hyperspeed, so it, for, relative to what that, that trend I was telling you about, where basically um, it's an unstructured jungle of individuals um, battling for readers and remuneration. And there's actually a way to kind of measure that, and it's called it's called Twitter. Twitter is this like newswire of humanity. Is anybody on it? Are you tweeting right now? Anybody? <laughs> Hashtag uh, Columbia is awesome. Um, but uh, you know the, the thing about Twitter is it allows anyone to build a following in an audience, and they can transport it anywhere they go. So this is kind of unprecedented. It's it's more than just that decline that that complete having of the industry I worked in because. Um, that's been really bad, but it's given you this this incredible empowering uh, opportunity to people. So, um, and it's unprecedented. I mean, it's shaping the information you rely on, not just for your jobs and in finance, business, wherever it might be. It you know, it's in your the reviews of products that you buy, restaurants, movies, you name it, in ways that are kind of radical and and kind of hard to actually see where they or to comprehend, and know where they're going. And then this new world. Um, a journalist with a Pulitzer Prize may not be worth as much as one that has 30,000 Twitter followers, that's, or a clout score of 85. Um, and that's, that's kind of, that's, this is disruption on a massive scale, but at the same time, it's incredibly empowering. And what matters really in, in the, 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 the journalist of, the few, of this age is going, what's gonna matter is their ability. It has nothing to do with the platform they're at, and we're seeing that happening all over the place. Um, and that brings me to the second illustration of this lesson, that it's sort of what you bring. It's sort of what you take with you. It's your skill. And this is on a personal level. Now, bear with me. This gets a little bit difficult, this terrain. But um, so about a year ago, actually just um, 11 months and a couple of days ago, uh, you know, ago um, a 20-year-old in my town uh, walked into a middle, uh, sorry, an elementary school. He killed six teachers, and he killed... Uh, 20 children, all in, in basically two seven-year-olds, and the rest were six years old. This is in Sandy Hook, uh, Connecticut. I grew up in, in, in Newtown, Connecticut, which is the same town as Sandy Hook. Um, and, uh, and I moved back there many years ago to raise my kids there. They're fine. They're older and, um, and, and we're, we're not in that school. But um, in the next couple of days after that, this was December 14th uh, of last year, a group of people, including myself, professionals, banded together, and we said, "We need to do something. This is this is completely, um, this can't ever happen in another town anywhere in this in this country, and um, and we certainly need to minister to the people in this town and, and to this town because no town has the resources, particularly a you know little ta New England town in Connecticut." Um, so we got together, and I look, I, I sort of when I was thinking about this talk, I thought, "Well, let's let's think about the transferability of skills." And the founders of this group, uh, including myself, were there was a marketing executive from Procter and Gamble. That place is like a cult, isn't it? I don't know. Does anybody work? But it, you know, they have this like they speak a different language. They have these words that they use. But but this guy had these skills to. Um, he had the skills of a Procter and Gamble, you know, executive, which were he was like the ultimate. He's like Mister Chief of Staff, you know, a guy who pulls. He brought those skills to bear in this group. We, we created a thing called Sandy Hook Promise, which is the, the, the nonprofit um, charitable group that we founded, which was there to help them work with a lot of the families that lost children and loved ones. You know, he's now the executive director of the organization, and he is moving it to you know new, moving it forward in ways that n he would never, on December 13th, have thought that his skills would be transferable to this incredible endeavor. Never would have thought that. Then I have uh, Tom Bittman, who's a who's a technology analyst at Gartner. This is a guy who, over the course of the last nine months or ten months, eleven months, has um, removed or had worked with Facebook and various other social media people to remove like six hundred images, unlicensed images of the children from Sandy Hook um, on behalf of the families. Again, not something a skill he never he ever thought that he was going to have, but he he was able to transfer it in um, in a moment of incredible disruption 
uh, to, to, for, for something that's a, a pretty noble pursuit. I look at Scott Wolfman, guy who, who basically is a, um, what is Scott? I guess he's like a uh, booking agent for colleges and things like that. He's now managing uh, so much of the media inquiries and speaking engagements for some of these families. You've probably seen them on if you watch Good Morning America. They were there last week, two of them. You, if you look at uh, Oprah's show, you'll see the Wheeler family. They'll be on there. He's doing that. Again, no skill he would have ever thought that would have been applicable. Um, anyway, I bring it all back down. Last week I was, I was helping, I took one of the moms, her name is Nelva Marquez Green, lost her little girl, Anna, and Mark Barden, who lost his little son, Daniel. And we went to do, as part of the Sandy Hook Promise, sort of talking about the, the, what we've accomplished in the year, went to go see newspapers. And so, you know, here we, so we go and we, not, we go over the Hartford Current to go see the, the, uh, the, uh, editorial team there. And you, you go in and, and, uh, I'm reminded of that disruption I told you about. So you go into this big uh, office building in the center of, of Hartford, Connecticut, and it's like a sea of empty desks. Um, and then, but then, you know, we went in, had this meeting, and I think we convinced that, you know, had a very productive meeting, a beautiful story was written. Went down to New Haven, Connecticut to go see the New Haven Register. Again, one of these um, things that in, when I was at Columbia in 1992, people said, yes, this will be a great place for your second job after you've gone to some unnamed place and written about the baseball um, and there we went in again. I mean, this wasn't even just empty desks. Like they hadn't even clipped the lawn in like, well, you know, since the summer. I mean, it, you sort of walked in, you thought, my God, this is sort of like Planet of the Apes. Someone left this building here. Oh, but look, there are some journalists there and there's as poorly dressed as I am. Um, but so it felt like at home. But, but well, anyway, I tell you all these stories, just the point being, and I don't know what you can take away from what I'm telling you. I have no idea what your, hopefully your business won't be anywhere near as disrupted as mine was. Um, um, but I would tell you, you know, you need to be prepared. You need to be prepared for disruption, both in your career and in your business, because certainly it's happening all over the place, whether it's globalization, automation, um, technology, um, and the third industrial revolution, I guess you could call it. Uh, and in your life, your life, you have to prepare for disruption. It, it just, uh, it's not something you, um, you know is going to happen. But you, one thing that is predictable is it will happen. So you know, take those skills you have and transfer them. Anyway, that's it. I think I will switch back to the uh, hand mic. Uh, you have to have a professor at an alumni event. Well, I'm your professor. <laughs> Uh, I am trained as a psychologist. I've been uh, doing research on decision making for the last 30 years, uh, teaching and working both in psychology departments and business schools. And here at Columbia, I'm cross-appointed in both. Uh, what I want to do is sort of give you a couple of lessons. I don't have nine, I only have two, <laughs> uh, that I've abstracted from my own research and those of colleagues. Uh, and then also from a much more abstract perspective than this wonderful uh, case studies we've heard, unpack them a little bit and sort of explore why we do what we do and what we should perhaps be doing instead a little bit differently, okay? So let me start with lesson number one. Lesson number one is we should start thinking about career opportunities or life changes a lot earlier than when we usually do it. Usually we do it when things are starting to go badly and we've been pushed into thinking about change. What we should be doing instead is to start thinking about it when things are going well, yeah? Now why? Why, why should we do that and why don't we do that, including myself, most of the time? Well, reason number one why we don't do what I just told you is that we all are stick in the mud. We all start as quo biased, yeah? And that's not necessarily a bad thing. When things are going well, uh, yeah, there's sort of no reason to think about why things could be doing, going better than they are. Uh, we tend to be risk averse. We think about what's good about our current state of affairs and there are many reasons for that. Uh, there are many, many other things we could be doing, but there's so many of them. It's hard to generate what they should be doing, what, what, what they should be, and it's hard to evaluate them because there's so many of them. The other reason, reason number two why we don't do what we should be doing is we are overconfident. Yeah? And I think all of the previous speakers gave us lots of uh, examples for why we should be worrying about things going south. Yeah? We shouldn't be just assuming things are fine the way they are and will continue like that, but we all do that. And again, th there's Plenty of reasons for why we tend to be overconfident uh, and why we oftentimes persist in our overconfidence despite 
lots of evidence to the contrary. Yeah? If we were all correctly calibrated about how much we're going to get done in a given day, we would never get up in the morning. Right? So it's, it's great to have this planning fallacy to, to sort of think about how, how great things will be, because then we're motivated to actually go and make it happen, and these things are self-fulfilling prophecies. But the other thing that has, I think, uh, become very apparent from these uh, case studies is that it's really, really useful to have a plan B in your back pocket before you go forth in a confident way and pursue plan A. Um, now, let me sort of talk about the third reason for why we don't plan ahead of time, uh, which is that we tend to sort of regret uh, errors of uh, commission. Okay, so let's assume you have this wonderful job uh, and your wife is happy, your kid is having, uh, you know, sort of financing for college, and you think, well, but I'm not particularly happy with this. You know, I could be doing better than that. I really should be going back to school, or I really should just sort of take that step uh, into the net uh, and start my own company. Well, what if it doesn't work out? Yeah? First of all, you're not never going to hear the end of that from your brother-in-law uh, or from your spouse, uh, but also yourself, you anticipate how bad you will feel when you actually sort of take that step and it doesn't work out. So we sort of really regret in anticipate regretting uh, errors of things that we actually did. Now let me sort of tell you one other fact. When people are on their deathbed or getting close to dying and you ask them, what is it that you regret in life? They don't regret the, the, the two or three things that they did that turned out badly. They regret all the opportunities that they didn't take. Yeah? And so late in life, when we look back on our lives, we really regret those errors of omissions. You know, those opportunities we sort of we, we thought about in passing, but then sort of walked away from because we were sort of so focused on the here and now and our current status quo. Yeah, so just keep that in mind uh, as you think about sort of regretting errors of uh, commission. Okay, so that was lesson number one. <laughs> Let me walk over here and tell you about lesson number two. So when you make these decisions about life changes career opportunities, uh, one thing I advise you to do is to use the full range of choice processes, of decision processes, or what I would call decision modes, at your disposal. Yeah? What do I mean by decision modes? Well, typically people will sort of say, well, make a list of pros and cons, yeah? or make a matrix, like consumer reports. Uh, here are your different alternatives, different job offers, here are the different attributes, you know, sort of income, uh, vacation time, uh, advancement potential, blah, 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 blah. Uh, think about sort of how each of these opportunities sort of fares on these dimensions. What is the importance of different uh, dimensions? Then you can sort of do a multi-attribute utility matrix, and the one with the highest score is the one that you should be doing. Uh, or we do it by just pros and cons, checklists. What, what's good about this? What's good about that? So all of these modes are analysis, right? We're thinking rationally in some sort of conscious way about what's good, what's bad about these different options. And that's great, and you certainly should be doing that. And I think I want to argue in a, in a minute, it's going to inform all of these other modes that we also have at our disposal. But when push comes to shove, most of the time, we don't make decisions you know, in a fully rational way. Yeah? Sort of two other modes, and there are at least two other modes uh, at our disposal are not decisions just with our head, but also with our heart. Yeah? We have emotional reactions, we have hopes, we have fears, uh, we have gut level reactions that are based on lots of past experience that are oftentimes quite valid, that kick in when we aren't even consciously aware about what it is that we're afraid of, but you know, it, it's helping us. It's an early warning system that tells us what's good in the world and what's bad about in the world. And we we certainly should be paying attention to those uh, head, uh, to these heart signals, these emotional signals as well. Because that's mode number two. Yeah? And then the third mode, that oftentimes, that also is influ our, in influencing our decisions, is making decisions by the book. There are rules of conduct, there are social norms. You shouldn't be changing your job when you're in your 50s. That's way too old. You should be doing that in your 30s. Uh, you do certain things uh, because you are a woman or because you're not a woman, because you have kids or you don't have kids. Yeah? And these rules oftentimes also influence our decisions. Um, and many times, these different modes, head, heart, and book, telling us the same option. Option A is the best one. Yeah? Or stick with your job, that's the thing to do. Uh, and if that's the case, you actually have high confidence in your decision, and you should be having high confidence in your decision, and you should be going ahead and doing that. Now, every once in a while, and you know, perhaps not so infrequently when you're thinking about change, the different modes tell you different stories. One of them says A, your head says A, your heart says B, and maybe the rules are sort of you know, inconclusive because you can think about a rule of conduct for each one. And let me sort of tell you uh, a story about that that goes back 20 years when I was teaching a course on decision analysis at the University of Chicago uh, in an MBA program. 
Uh, and the first assignment I gave people, the MBA students, was to take an important decision they were making, currently making their life, uh, and to come up with a multi-attribute utility matrix. You know, what are the different choice options? What are the different attributes? Uh, think about your importance based on these attributes, and then sort of tell me which, the op which option it, it is that you, you will be choosing. And the day before the assignment was due, a woman came, came to my office during office hours, and she said, it's not working. I said, well, what do you mean it's not working? She said, well, I have these three options, uh, and I keep, you know, so the analysis is telling me the wrong one. So I said, well, what, what are the options? Well, it turns out she was dating three guys in the previous year. <laughs> <laughs> this was the second year, just came back from, from, from the summer. She wanted to know which of the guys she should be going steady with. <laughs> and so she had these, you know, three candidates. She had the different attributes. Uh, um, physical attractiveness, sense of humor, reliability, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and she said, well, I mean, I really want B, yeah? But whatever I do, I'm not coming up with B. So I said, well, why don't we work backwards? <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's evaluate how you rated those, and that was fine. And I said, well, let's now look at your importance weights. Yeah, wh what would the importance weights have to be for you to come up with B as the best one? Well, we did that, and the only combination of weights was everything was on physical attractiveness. <laughs> 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 now, this was useful to her because now she could decide, and clearly her gut was telling her to go sort of with, with a good-looking guy, yeah? and perhaps that was okay for a second-year MBA student. You yeah, didn't have to marry this guy. But yeah, <laughs> basically, <laughs> So she ended up not going with analysis, but going with her heart. But doing the analysis actually helped her to clarify what her heart was responding to. Uh, and using that, she could then evaluate, was that what she wanted to do? Yeah? Was that the rule, everything on physical attractions that she was happy with, or not? Uh, and so she had the option of deciding to go one way or the other. Yeah? And so let me just sort of finish on that, and I think we can take this into discussion. Thank you, thank you so much to our distinguished speakers. We're going to have a Q&A session, but while our speakers um, maybe have a seat up here on the stage, I'd like to um, take care of a, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, the first is I wanted to call your attention to the back of your program. There are a couple of very um, interesting events coming up that we think might be of particular um, intrigue for this audience. One is an entrepreneur event called Tech in the City. It's at the Time Warner Center. The second is uh, an event in February, which is um, ancillary to this one. It's called the Changing Jobs Landscape. So while here we've heard some personal stories, some professional insight, some career coaching, and some psychology, um, in February we're going to actually be taking a look at the jobs landscape from people who are experts um, from, um, with a different set of insights. Also, we, if you noticed, we had a raffle up at the front desk. Um, would you like to choose the winner? OK, we'll announce the winner afterwards. Um, there are mics around. Where's the mic? Great. There's Emily. Hi. Um, feel free to raise your hand. She can bring the mic to you. Okay. Any questions for any and or all of our panelists? I have a question for Dr. Weber. How can you tell the difference between and within the modes of decision making, kind of a gut feeling versus fear of risk, particularly as you're considering career transition. Thank you. So I don't think there need, needs to be a difference. I mean, fear of, I mean, fear is an emotion. It's a gut level reaction. Yeah? And then I guess the question that you're asking is sort of, should you give in to that fear or should you sort of try to overcome it? And I think sort of, you know, and, and of course part of that is an individual difference. You know, sort of people talk about, you know, there are not that many individual differences economists allow, but risk aversion is one of them. You know, it's actually the, 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 the single one. Uh, and yeah, we all know people sort of who are more risk seeking and who are more risk averse, and that's all right. And you have to live with yourself and you have to live with your own reactions to different types of situations. Uh, and so I think to some extent it's quite reasonable uh, to, to listen to your fears. Now, I think where that sort of uh, recommendation uh, breaks down is when your fear can be irrational. Yeah? And so oftentimes we are afraid of things yeah, because, we, you know, because they're uncertain. It's not that we have experienced you know, that sort of different universe uh, being in there uh, and sort of think that you know, it's too variable or you know, the downside is too large, but it's just the uncertainty but not quite knowing what we're going to encounter that makes us afraid of that. 
Uh, and I think there, I think it helps to sort of get as much uh, advice from people actually who have been in that situation, especially people who are similar to you, who can tell you what the reality is really like, or to even expose yourself. You know? so, so take a week's vacation uh, and, 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 and be an intern or volunteer for that sort of job or for that sort of you know, different lifestyle to see what it feels like. Uh, question, I guess, for all four of you maybe. Is it necessary to have a plan B, or is it better just to have a plan A and realize that plan A can't fail, but while you're doing plan A, you're always, you know, plan Bs can pop up in a plan A, whereas like your total focus is achieving your goal, because if you're not focused completely on that and you have this like sort of backstop you know, it's like if you're going after plan A and you say, well, I got 100000 in the bank and, you know, well, I can go to plan B if I get to this. But, you know, it's like you're not completely focused. Is it better just to be plan A, go for it, and if plan A fails, then you assess and see the contacts you made, everything else after that? So I would say start off with the plan A with three subsets to the plan so it all stays within the plan and the backup should be a financial backup. If you actually try to go after two professional opportunities simultaneously, you'll essentially end up halfway on both. So one plan with you know some variability on how you would handle it and then money in the bank so that if it doesn't work out, you can move to a new plan A. I don't think you necessarily need to have a plan B, but I think so to play with plans B, C, and D, especially when you're bored, like sitting on the subway on a really boring concert, yeah, does, doesn't hurt. Uh, and I, I think sort of just to know that sort of when things change, it's not going to be the end of the world. I think that's the important sort of realization. Yeah, I used to think, well, there's always a post office. Of course, now the post office will no longer be around much longer. <laughs> but yeah, I think to, to, to realize yeah, that sort of yeah, you have other opportunities yeah, and, and also fully realize that sort of even if you have a plan B, most likely it won't be plan B that you're pursuing, but plan C. D and E, uh, I think, I think to, but not to be too fixed on the way things are, I think is not a, not a bad idea. Which is, so the issue is there's this thing called the internet. So if you have a plan A, there's about 12,000 different options coming at you all the time. So the more additional options you introduce into your mind, the more confusing it all gets. So I still go back because we're in the 21st century and you're getting pummeled with options all the time. The best thing is to stick with one and really stay focused on that with all the distraction. I apologize, I didn't get a program. Um, the gentleman who was a year behind me, class of 1981, hey, I, I can't believe it. You, you, with all of your credentials, and you spent two years, and you had a Columbia degree, you had a Columbia engineering degree, right? You, you had two degrees? Well, the Columbia engineering degree is like, is incredibly, ridiculously hard. And it, so, I, A, uh, I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of shocked, like n no one offered you any kind of job unless you were asking for jobs that paid you several million dollars. That's A, but B, and this is, this is more for the whole group, is, is, is as, as, as many of us become freelancers and entrepreneurial and all that, you know, there's lots of talk about LinkedIn, but what, in theory, and this sort of goes back to looking for a job. In theory, in theory, it's easier to very quickly find out all the people who may be looking for you. And is is LinkedIn is LinkedIn the only answer, or or are there other other ways to effectively access the 300 million or so uh, folks out there who who may be looking for you, not just the United States but elsewhere? I personally found LinkedIn helpful to me really only as sort of an excuse to talk to somebody I knew I wanted to talk to, but didn't have a real great excuse for talking to them otherwise. So you kind of, I found LinkedIn to be a great break the ice kind of tool, but um, I personally didn't really use it much beyond that. I use it to snoop on people. <laughs> if I want to find out uh, a bit, I, and I will say sometimes, when I see folks on, you know, I do it to research is what the right word. Um, but uh, when I do research on people, uh, one of the things I notice is a, a, a huge LinkedIn profile sometimes can scream desperation. So I'd just be, you know, like where it's like, I've got 25 people saying how awesome I am. Um, sometimes you're like, okay, do you really need to do that? 
So I would just be care. I, I mean, I look. I don't. I've I have not spent a lot of time on LinkedIn, but I, you know, from a prof- for professional reasons, I've gotten I've gotten to use it a lot. I usually to research people, and and there seems to be a correlation between a very large LinkedIn page and um, the ut- utility of their skills. Nope, nothing on LinkedIn. I, I only use LinkedIn to compete with my husband. <laughs> was a broad generalization just so if, if there are people here with very large LinkedIn pages I <laughs> don't mean to say that Bill and Eric you, you both talked about career changes that you guys made when there was some external event you know financial crisis 9-11 etc uh, I'm wondering if any of the panelists could give some detail about how to make a change when there isn't that kind of external thing that happens. You know, where, where do you get that motivation from if there isn't some really traumatic thing that happens to, to get you to, to make that next step? I can actually give you a little bit of that. Um, so when, when, I, when I founded this company, Breaking Views, in 2000, uh, it was not under duress. It wasn't because there was some shock to the system. In fact, like I said, 2000 was the greatest year ever for newspaper advertising, yet I left the sort of traditional media. Um, because um, there were a couple of things, maybe some of the things you pointed out. I was probably 32, um, so it's a little bit, e- I don't know, there was a little, there was definitely a sort of, it was easier. Um, and I'm now 45, I think it would be harder. Um, and not just because I, my, you know, like you know, I have two kids and you know, all this stuff. It's just, uh, you just may be more flexible at that point. There was, the other things that were, in, in my, to my mind, were it was, I guess, to, in a way to your, your point about the net, Eric, which was like, it'll, I'll find, if, if I jump, it'll, I assume, that, I don't assume, but there's going to be, there's only one way to know it's there, and that's by, you know, making, you know, taking some risk. But, um, I mean, I definitely, I mean, I'd be really interested to hear your view on this, actually, uh, because, um, maybe not to take the conversation away, but you know, that risk averse thing. I mean, is there a, like a, is there one of these like curves where age goes up, risk aversion kind of goes up and. So, so that, that's a really long story. <laughs> uh, but yes, I think people be, do become, or they, they look like they're becoming more risk averse as, as they get older. Uh, but I think when you look at it more carefully, it tends to be the perception of the risk that goes up. And if you control for that, you know, sort of the willingness to take a risk as you perceive it actually stays pretty constant across the lifespan. Uh, and so I think you know, that, that gets to the discussion we had earlier about how, how accurate are your perceptions of, of, of certain kinds of risks. Uh, and there are individual differences. You know, some people, if you think about what, what is risk, risk means that's variability. You can't quite exactly predict what you're going to get. It might be a lot better than what you, could, what you currently have, or it might be a lot worse than what you currently have. And most of the time, people don't give us probabilities in these real life situations, right? You have to sort of generate those you know, based on gut level feeling, usually. Uh, and so some people look more at the upside, you know, the eternal optimist. Some people look more at the eternal downside. And you know, I think to the, to the question that sort of we, we started out with, uh, what triggers you know, uh, considerations of change when things are going well? I think typically uh, what triggers this is some sort of feeling that, that there's something missing, you know, that either you're not using sort of the full range of your potential, you're getting bored, you've been doing something for a while, you're getting externally rewarded for it, but it just sort of, you know, it, 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 it leaves you feeling sort of you know, incomplete. Or you, you meet someone who sort of you know, seems to be doing extremely well and say, well, I could be that person, I could be having that sort of fun. Why am I not doing that? You know? And it doesn't have, doesn't have to be something that's wrong with your position, but you realize it could be better. So either something, an internal signal, you know, or some sort of external reminder, you know, that, that, that things could be different. And, you know, and, and I think getting back to the, to the risk, I think, you know, sort of some of us, you know, have been more conditioned to sort of to be a little afraid of change. A lot of it has probably has to do with uh, child rearing, you know, whether we were punished for sticking at our necks or whether we were actually rewarded for doing that. That's kind of hard to change. Uh, but I think sort of to the extent that fears are irrational, I think sort of collecting information and actually you know, sort of exposing yourself in an experiential fashion to what that would be like and sort of doing little trial periods, you know, sort of you know, taking, taking a month off and, and, and just seeing what it would be like to start this, this new company doing some research on that. I think that's not a bad idea to get over that hump about sort of the fear of the unknown. I guess I want to say, because of all those experiences, the notion that the net only appears when you jump is something that I just remind myself all the time so that rather than going into the loop 
of, oh, what's going to happen and it's dangerous. It's like, no matter what happens, I'm here, I'm alive, and I'm breathing. So obviously the net has appeared at every moment. So if you make that a daily mantra, then essentially you're going to shut down all that waiting for a disaster. This is a question for everyone. Uh, let, let's say that you are in a, at a point where you have to decide, do I go up the ladder or do I switch fields? Uh, what would you choose? Going up the ladder definitely shows professional growth. Uh, I guess it also says that you can take on responsibility and uh, you, be, you go into a leadership position. But switching might seems also interesting because there are so many other options out there that are very tempting. And you think you have the skills, but still, what do you do? You stumped them. I mean, I would say do what interests you the most. I mean, I know that I personally, you know, I'm just kind of a blockhead, hardhead. And, you know, I spent two years trying to get a job I never got because I said if I work hard enough to keep working, I'm going to get it. But, um, and it wasn't necessarily anything I really probably wanted to do. Yeah, I, I'd second that. I mean, it, the, I guess part of what I was trying to convey is that it's sort of what skill, what is it you have that's special about you that you, that, that you know, makes you, I don't know, that makes you different. Because wherever you go, you can apply that, those energies or that, you know, those skills to whatever comes up. And uh, so, I mean, I, I, when I hear someone say climbing up the ladder, I said, what, 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 the ladder is, one thing I think we can, you've all learned is the ladder can crumble at any time. So if you've basically decided it's the ladder that you want to climb, you know, good luck, man, because that ladder, you know, is, it's, the ladders are shaky. So the ladder that I thought, you know, one could go, you know, hey, I'm going to go and do this newspaper, that, and then you go up, and then someday I'll have this great office in the New York Times in the corner, looks out on the Hudson. And, you know, well, now that building's been, you probably sublet it when you were at CIBC <laughs> or something. You know, it's like, you know, sale and lease back or something so they could pay the bills. Um, so just be careful with the ladder. Think about what it is that you have, because when the ladder goes out, you need, still need to have some skill to grab, grab the the rock or whatever the hell it is. Uh, so I, I guess I would say the, the up the ladder is a completely different skill set than when you're lower on the ladder. So, you know, higher up the ladder, it's all a game of politics and not to do with the work. So when you're making that decision about where you want to go, you have to really kind of understand what does it mean to move up the ladder? Because the top person on the ladder is not doing any work. They're just playing politics. So if you want to do that, that's great. But if that's not one you do, you'll be roadkill pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's a great note to end on. Thank you to all of our distinguished speakers. I would like to briefly thank Lindsay Hotaley, and it's her hard work and effort, along with several of our colleagues at Columbia who have made this event tonight possible. She's also the CA Career Services Coordinator. So any brilliant ideas you have about how we can further connect you, uh, you can seek her out. Um, and she can announce the raffle winner. Hi, everyone. I'd just like to echo Emily and just say um, thank you so much to all of the speakers um, and all of you for coming out today. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, many familiar faces in the audience and new ones. Um, hoping to meet you all at the networking reception. It is across the hall in the Alexander Hamilton room. Um, but before we break, uh, I'd like to just pull out um, a winner for this raffle. We have some business cards that we were collecting, so I'm going to shake it up. Um, we're giving away a book, a career book. Um, and we have Nathan Scavello. Nathan, come on up. You win the first 90 days. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you again, and uh, please enjoy the networking reception in the next room. <laughs>